All right, welcome to Disability Rights South Carolina University's September session on service animals. Um, my name is Maggie Knowles, and I'm just going to give you a few housekeeping items before we get started today. Uh, first, let everyone know that we are recording this session, and we do plan to put this session on YouTube afterwards. Um, so just to let everybody know that um, the YouTube session will go up in a few weeks. Um, and we will make that available to everybody. Everyone has been muted and will stay muted throughout the session. Uh, if we will take questions at the end. And if you have them, you can use the chat box or you can also raise your hands and we will get to those afterwards. Um, and I think that's it for that. I also just wanted to go over, we have two more sessions this year. Um, October 18th, we'll be doing assistive technology, and November 15th, we will be doing our second session on guardianship. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce to you guys one of our attorneys at Disability Rights South Carolina, Rebecca Fulmer. She's going to be our presenter today, and she will start talking about service animals. Hi, good lunchtime, everybody. This is Rebecca Fulmer. Um, folks at the office tend to call me Becky. I would like to know if any of you um, have service animals or are considering acquiring them. And if you could just use the chat to, to indicate, yes, you are, or yes, you have. Um, Maggie can share that information with me. Next slide, please. About our agency, Disability Rights South Carolina, we are a nonprofit. Our services are free to, to folks with disabilities across South Carolina. We are the mandated protection and advocacy agency for South Carolina. This is an, a, 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 um, a, a national mandate under federal law. We're independent of other agencies that provide treatment or services to people with disabilities. And generally we would work very closely with them. Our mission is to protect and advance the legal, civil and human rights of people with disabilities in the state. Uh, until not terribly long ago, we were known as protection and advocacy for people with disabilities. Our name has changed to Disability Rights South Carolina. Next slide, please. Our agency provides a number of services. If you call in, you'll likely be, the phone will be answered or you will be uh, sent to someone in the part of our agency called information and referral. From there, you may be provided with information that you need um, email over the phone, or you may refer, be referred out to others in the agency. We provide legal support, which extends from, uh, say, advice like here on um, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, we will occasionally provide self-advocacy assistance, which is always something we hope to do to provide you with enough information that you can advocate for yourselves. And we will also go further and provide direct representation in certain circumstances, which might include helping you communicate with an employer, um, filing a charge with the South Carolina Human Affairs Commission or the EEOC. Uh, further legal support is possible, but that's something that's, that's rather rare. Education and outreach, this is an example. We're reaching out to the community to let you know about our services and the rights of folks with disabilities. Monitoring investigations are done largely by our, our uh, abuse and neglect team. And we focus on advancing public policy, supporting individuals with disabilities. We have a lobbyist and um, we, we help to draft uh, legislation from time to time. Next slide, please. Service animals. Now, today is about service animals. With one minor exception, 
we will only talk about service animals and not about emotional support animals. And we will also focus on service animals under the Americans with Disabilities Act that from now on I will refer to as the ADA. There are service animals under other federal and state laws, but we will not focus on those here. There are service animals protected under fair housing laws, whether that be federal or state, along with those emotional support animals. I will mention this later, but our focus again is on service animals and the rights of people with disabilities under the ADA. Next slide, please. What I'd like for you to do is, is just to take a look at, at, I've got four pictures here, two on this page, two on the next. So that by the end of this presentation, you may have a better idea of which animals might be service animals under the ADA. There are two photos on this page. The one on the left is of a child sitting in an environment that looks like it might be a school or a government building. He's, he's reaching out and, and patting a black Labrador retriever who's quite large. The photo on the right is of a friend of mine who works for Able, South Carolina. This is an outside photograph. She's seated in, an elect, in a wheelchair and beside her is her dog whose name is Shaq. He's a, a, a let's see, a, a white lab or a yellow lab. Next, next play, <laughs> page, please. What about these? On the left, we have a photograph uh, taken. It looks like it might be the living room of an apartment or house. There's a, a young boy lying on his stomach um, with his head, hands above his head. And lying on the lower part of his back is a rather large yellow lab. On the right is a photograph taken in an airport environment. There are two people, it looks to be like an, an, um, perhaps a mother and, and a, a daughter leading a horse. It's a miniature horse through the airport. So think about these photographs as, as we move forward. Next slide. I don't see a picture. You don't see a picture? Does anybody else uh -uh. see pictures? I don't see no pictures at all. Um, Maggie, did you? Um, yes, I see the presentation. Okay, were there photographs there? Yep. I'm not sure why Chastity didn't, but in any event, I'm describing them because we may have either now or later um, uh, folks who are blind, and I want them to, to understand what we're looking at as well. All right, this slide, what is a service animal? Back up to what the ADA is. It's a law that protects a person from being treated unfairly just because they have a disability. A service animal is an animal trained to help a person with a disability to do something that's hard for them to do. Under the ADA, a service animal is a dog. Now you will see here on the slide, it says, or miniature horse, I will explain that, that is trained to do work or tasks for a person with a disability. The miniature horse part is because the ADA regulations since 2011, I believe it is, described a service animal as only a dog. <laughs> Slightly confusing is a separate provision in the ADA that says miniature horses may also be service animals. So the truth is, a service animal could be a dog or miniature horse that meets the standards of size, type, weight for the horse. Um, you'll see later on, there is no such restriction for dogs. Generally, this, this presentation will be about dogs and not about miniature horses. The important thing to remember all along is service animals are not pets. They are working animals. Next slide, please. This is, this is a, a more traditional definition of service animals. Service animals are dogs who are individually trained, that's a key word, to do work or perform tasks that are directly related to the person's disability. Some tasks 
a dog might be trained to perform, such as say rounding up the cat to come in the house in the evening, that's not directly related to the person's disability. But the tasks we're going to talk about today are disabilities, as you may know, are physical, mental, or cognitive, meaning intellectual. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm going from simple to slightly more complex, but I wanted to share some of this with you. The ADA itself has, I mean, oh no, I, you know what happened? My dogs, I've got three, <laughs> were locked up in my bedroom. They have now come out and are squeaking toys. Uh, if this interferes, Maggie, you tell me, I'll go lock them up again, but they got out. <laughs> what a, such a typical thing to happen on a service dog. Oh Lord, service dog presentation. That's Jasper, he likes his squeaky toys. There, there are a number of titles in the ADA. Titles two and three govern state and local government agencies. Title three in particular governs public accommodations that provide goods and services to the public. Those are private entities. The government agencies and the public accommodations are required under the ADA to make reasonable modifications in their policies and practices when it's necessary to accommodate folks with disabilities. Title I of the ADA, which is near and dear to my heart, governs employment, and it requires employers to provide what is called reasonable accommodations to allow people with disabilities not only to do their jobs, but also to enjoy the benefits and privileges of employment like people without disabilities. That is a key concept. And there was a recent case involving a railroad, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and a veteran who had a service dog. The, the veteran, the employee did not need the job to help the dog to help him do his job, but he needed the dog to be as comfortable as other people without disabilities who were working there. So that is the aspect of the definition. Enjoy the benefits and privileges of employment like people with disabilities. Now, in any of these scenarios, if there is a no pets policy, that generally must be modified to allow service animals. Next slide, please. Here's some examples of works and tasks that service animals can be, again, trained to do. That's the key term, trained. Um, and we'll go into some of these in a little bit more detail later if we have time. Guiding a person who's blind, alerting a person who's deaf to sounds or to people coming up around them, physical su support, stability, balance. Usually those are the larger animals. And sometimes th that's exactly what the, the miniature horses may be trained to do. Pulling a wheelchair, opening doors, turning on lights, detecting um, the onset of, of, of a seizure, um, such as an epileptic seizure, and protecting that person from harm when the person experiences the seizure. Reminding a person to take medication when the dog senses it's that time. Calming a person with post-traumatic stress disorder. And then the psychological aspect, psychiatric or neurological support, which might say, for example, interrupt some destructive behavior, compulsive behavior of the owner or lessen the owner's anxiety. We'll go into more detail. Next slide, please. This is a slide with two pictures. The title is Help for Deaf or Blind. On the left is a young woman with wearing a, a mortar and um, um, what do you call that, Maggie? <laughs> the, the, the thing that you wear when you're when you graduate, gown, gown, yes, <laughs> the mortar and gown. And she has um, a dog with her, a black and white, a bully breed, who's also wearing a mortar. The photo on the right is of a young man with dark glasses, um, being led by a yellow lab. Next slide, please. Assistance with mobility. Here's my friend Dory again and her dog Shaq. The three photos. On the left, Shaq is pulling, tugging on a rope that is tied to 
a handle of a door that the type of handle that flips up and down so that he could open the door and pull the door open the middle side's kind of cute shack is pushing the buttons between two elevators and on the right shack is pushing the button on a pole on a street corner which allows pedestrians to cross next slide please Diabetes alert. We're going to talk about medical disabilities, but this one's important um, because it's it's frankly very common and fairly well known. This young man is a photograph of a young man in a plaid shirt outside. Um, he he has diabetes, and his dog, his his service dog, is a blue merle Australian Shepherd, who is sitting in front of him and reaching up to to tap him on the leg. These dogs are able to detect um, blood pressure, not, not blood pressure, um, blood sugar levels, either high or low, and then alert their owners that this is happening and sometimes provide, bring the medication to them that they need. Next slide, please. Medical alert and response. I'd kind of like to know from you if we have some time any any ideas that, that you might have about situations where a service dog could alert its owner to a medical need and respond to that need with some type of protection. So if if you have a moment while I while I continue to talk, um, go ahead and enter your ideas or questions in the chat. Medical alert could be something as simple as a dog catching a whiff of peanuts to protect someone who has peanut allergy, which can be deadly. Um, we mentioned hypoglycemia. Low blood sugar has a particular unique scent, apparently, that the dogs can pick up. Dogs can recognize heartbeat abnormalities that might signal a heart attack. They may alert to impending crises like an asthma attack, migraines, dizziness, loss of consciousness, a, an epileptic seizure we mentioned, and cancer, a lot of research going on right now with cancer detection. Um, the, the theory is that many cancers have unique scents that can be picked up by dogs trained to do this. Parkinson's disease, that was new to me. Responses can include um, calling for help. Dogs can be trained, actually, believe it or not, to dial, well, to push a button for 911 on a, on a, on a phone, um, to provide body pressure for the person to, to calm them or, or help with their balance, to lie on a person's legs to help blood flow go better to the brain. They are the, the signals are, are individual, selected as needed, and again, individually trained. Dogs can be trained to, for instance, sense the seizure coming on and then bring a medical pouch to their person in their mouth. Becky, you do have what? two comments? Yeah. I'm ready. Uh, one is that somebody said maybe sensing that someone is about to have a panic attack or a seizure. And someone else said their son's service dogs helps him with his meltdowns. Okay, I'm having a hard time hearing you, but I think I understood. I think you asked about, uh, well, just to ask me again, just a little bit louder. I was just letting you know the comments in the chat box. Right. Uh, one person said that maybe sensing someone is about to have a panic attack. Panic attack. Seizure. And another person said that their son service dog helps with his meltdowns. Uh, yes, absolutely. And again, there's a crossover between psychiatric issues and medical issues that involve physical things. We will get to the, to the psychological disabilities sh very shortly. I'm glad, thank you for your questions or comments. Next slide, please. And of course, dogs are not limited to doing just one thing. This is actually, I find very, very interesting. Um, this is a friend of mine, Melissa. 
who has a service dog named Brett. Brett is big, <laughs> as you can see by the pictures on the screen. On the left, there's Brett. He's a Great Dane, a great, great Dane. And he is in some passageway in an airplane. And on the right, there's a picture, a closer picture of Brett uh, sniffing my friend's leg. Yeah, Chastity, I don't know why you can't see these pictures. That's that's really a shame. Um, and I don't understand that, but it'll you, you can do it later. We'll, we'll make sure you do it later. So Brett helps my friend with stability. Like I told you, a lot of dogs, people who need their disabilities mean that they need support or help with balance. She's got a, a, a bad leg, bad knee. And he helps her with that. She can hang on to him and not fall over. I, I'm sure he weighs more than she does. And on the right is quite interesting. I, if you're aware of MRSA, it's a, it's a type of um, bacteria that can cause staph infections. And it can be, it can be deadly. Uh, some folks who have had an episode of MRSA and gone to the hospital for treatment and gotten over it, there's still something that stays in their body and it recurs. Brett picked up on the MRSA without my friend ever knowing in the beginning what it was. So he kind of trained her, himself and her, to recognize if the MRSA came back just by its scent. And he has been incredibly, incredibly helpful. Next slide, please. Here we go, for those of you interested in psychiatric service animals. They are trained to sense that a symptom of a psychiatric disorder is about to happen and to take a specific action to support or lessen the attack. An emotional support animal is not a service animal. It's not a psychiatric service animal. The difference between them is that a psychiatric service animal is specifically trained to either alert to something or to respond to something. Emotional support animals are very, very valuable. I got three of them here. <laughs> you know, they provide comfort, companionship, and emotional support. The fair housing laws will allow emotional support animals, and they need not just be dogs. They could be, say, a parakeet um, or a hedgehog. I mean, the various things could be emotional support animals, but only a dog or the miniature horse um, could be a psychiatric service animal. I, I think an important point is that if folks get a dog for safety reasons, the crime deterrent effect of the dog's presence does not constitute worker tasks under the ADA. Next slide, please. I think I need to pick it up, don't I? Here we go. Many psych psychiatric disabilities involve anxiety. There's slight subtle changes in the body that happen when a person with such a disability begins to experience anxiety, or as someone said, a panic attack. The dog can then approach the person, usually with touch, redirect the person such that the, the level of anxiety is, is reduced. Next slide, please. Autism support. This is one of my, my, my favorite thoughts here. Autism is spectrum, as, as many of you know. This photograph, I'm sorry, I forgot to describe the previous photograph. This photograph is, is the photograph of the young boy lying on the floor of the living room with a yellow lab lying on his back. This young boy could very well have autism and be, be suffering from loss of self-control. The animal is trained to apply what's called deep pressure to the child so that the child can calm down and get out of that moment of extreme difficulty. Next slide, please. PTSD. As many of you know, a lot of veterans from our, from our wars um, are, are, are being um, advised to adopt 
service animals that can help with PTSD, although PTSD is in no way limited to veterans. Uh, people who are victims of crime, uh, abuse and abuse and, and trauma, other traumatic events can also suffer from PTSD. With respect to PTSD, I, um, th there have been a lot of articles about how these dogs, uh, and the photo here is of, of a man with a bald head wearing red shoes, patting his golden retriever, have been used to reduce suicidal thoughts, to interrupt um, nightmares, to bring their person back to the present um, after the person has, has dissociated in some way. Uh, sometimes it's necessary for the anim animal to go ahead of the person, to perform a room search, to assure the person there's nothing dangerous in that next room, or to remind them of routine tasks. Next page, please. Now, this is the only slide I have on emotional support animals, but it, but it is very important, I think, just to make the distinction. Emotional support animal need not be a dog or a miniature horse. Um, emotional support animals are not, as I said earlier, service animals under the ADA, and they do not have the protections or the people who have them do not have the rights that are provided to service animals under the ADA. But emotional support animals have protection in housing under federal and state law. And you know, any, any agency or public service can, can open their doors to support animals. It's not forbidden. I'm just trying to explain what the rights are. It, it's interesting to me that this young person um, has gender dysphobia. And just this past month, our Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals held that gender dysphobia was a disability um, under, under the ADA. So a person with gender dysphoria has a disability and might have the right to, as in this picture, have a well-loved duck accompany them in where, the, where they live and other places where they're allowed. Next slide, please. Training service animals. You don't have to have a professional trainer. Most people don't. You may train the dogs yourself or have other folks help you train the dogs. However, the dogs must be already trained before the ADA would permit them to go into public or be used in the public. There's an exception for that in South Carolina. South Carolina allows folks to use service dogs in training, which is kind of a good thing because you wonder how they're going to be trained to operate well in the public if they can't get in the public in the first place. <laughs> so I think it's a smart idea. Common sense. This is a big deal for, for me and other folks who have and love animals, dogs in particular. Be sure that if you have a service animal, you have gotten at the very least good training in behavior around people and other animals. You're an ambassador for these service animals. And without that, folks who really need them might not have them. They might not be allowed when needed. Next, next slide, please. Where are they allowed? We go back to um, the titles of the ADA. In public uh, accommodations and state and local gov government services, Service animals are allowed, generally speaking, in every place that members of the public are allowed to go. People with disabilities who use service animals cannot be isolated, pushed away, pushed aside from other patrons or treated less fa favorably. They cannot be charged fees that are not charged to other patrons without animals. And if a business, say a hotel, for example, requires a deposit or a fee to be paid by patrons with pets, that fee must be waived for service animals because service animals are not pets. And of course, if damage is, is done, the owner should, should cover that. Next, next slide, please. A list of public accommodations, lodging. I'm, I'm going to speed through this a little bit more because I'm afraid I might not, I might run out of time public accommodations, lodging, 
to include places like mobile home parks and homeless shelters, restaurants, including self-service lines. Think about that. You can go through a cafeteria line if it's public with your dog and bars, public transportation to include taxis, Ubers, um, bus and trains. Now there's a difference between an airport terminal and the airline's property. That's a subject that we cannot cover today. For airlines, there is a law called the Air Carrier Access Act. And it applies to airlines and allows the airlines to have special rules, which are generally, well, they've been, they've been changed. They're more restrictive now than they used to be. But the airport terminal is a public place and service animals should be allowed there. Places of public entertainment like theaters, concert halls, libraries. There was a case with, it was an outdoor concert and some person with a disability had brought his or her little dog who happened to yap only a couple times because someone disturbed him. The case went to court and it was decided that the person with the disability had a right to have that dog as long as, as the dog didn't yap continuously during the music production. Next slide, please. Other public accommodations, retail places, groceries, pharmacies, services like laundries, banks, lawyers' offices, medical offices, voting locations, and hospitals, a note on that later, recreation places, including gym, bowling alleys, golf course, education, I got a note on this too later, including K through 12 schools, nurseries, college and universities, and social services, senior citizen centers, daycares, food banks. Next slide, please. Service dogs in schools. This is a young lady named Elena and her service dog, Wonder. In 2017, the United States Supreme Court ruled that the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, protected this child it's right to have her dog accompany her in school. The school had argued she didn't need the dog because services could be provided by staff, teaching assistants and the like. But the family prevailed, at least at the first level. And the Supreme Court sent this case back below and said, you must apply, well, you first must decide that it's the ADA that applied and the Supreme Court made it pretty clear that it did. And then you must decide whether this child is entitled to have her service dog under the ADA. A number of years later, the case was settled um, amicably. Next slide, please. What's not covered? Okay, religious institutions. Temples, mosques, synagogues, churches, although they may, of course, have their own policies and it's always encouraged that they welcome everybody, like the picture I mentioned earlier of the young man with glasses and, and his, uh, his guide dog. Um, the issue there was whether he could um, access a church or not. This was a public story. Um, Hospital operating rooms, as opposed to, say, the patient's own rooms or cafeterias in the hospital. Hospital operating rooms just logically may need a very sterile environment. So dogs should, should naturally be excluded from the operating rooms. Ambulances, that depends. If the folks running the ambulance service decide that um, that there's room in the ambulance, that the situation is not so dire that having the dog accompany the owner would cause problems, would threaten the owner's health, then yes, they could decide to allow the dog in the ambulance. Otherwise, they must make arrangements for the dog to be um, re reconnected with the owner later on. Zoos, it depends. Uh, some predators like lions, you know, might get a little upset if they see a dog looking over at them, you know, especially in an open air zoo. So that wouldn't work. But there are other places in the zoo, I'll show you a picture, um, where, do where service dogs might be very welcome. So 
places where allowing service animals would fundamentally alter the nature of operations or pose a threat to the health and safety of somebody um, are places where the animals may be logically and legally excluded. Next page, please. There we go. Now that little penguin is not a natural predator of those two dogs. It's a photograph. It's it's a it's a picture of a, a penguin behind glass. And these dogs are very welcome in this portion of the zoo. Next slide, please. What can you be asked? This is important. To protect your privacy, if you are a person with a disability, and when it's not already obvious to everyone, a place of public accommodation or government service can ask only two questions. Is this a service dog required because of a disability? Some people say the sentence should be shortened to, is this a service dog? The second question is, what work or task has the dog been trained to do? Now, I said when it's not already obvious, if, if a blind person is using a guide dog, that's pretty obvious. No questions should be asked. But many disabilities are invisible. And those are the only two questions that a person should be asked by, say, you walk into a restaurant. Those are the only questions that the proprietor, the staff of the restaurant should ask you. The staff cannot ask you about your disability. It cannot require medical documentation of your disability or a certificate showing that the dog is a service dog. Next slide, please. There are many websites and you may have seen them. Many, many, many. If you start Googling service dogs like I've done the past few days, the first websites that pop up are these websites that purport to register your dog, put your dog on a service dog registry, sell you a vest or um, tags that say federal law um, permits this dog as a service dog. There is no such thing under federal law and, and there's no state or federal animal registry. These sites are written, no matter how sharp they are, and sometimes they have helpful information, they can be misleading, and they really are after your money. You do not need that. No certification, no vests, no tags. There's one thing that service dogs must not be exempt from in this category, and that is local governments or public health requirements, um, such as vaccination, um, registering your dog with the city uh, and licenses. Service dogs are not exempt from those things. Next slide, please. Under control. Service animal must always be under the control of its handler. Now, the handler could be somebody other than the person with a disability because some people with disabilities cannot physically handle the dog, but there must be someone handling the dog and the dog must be under control. Ways of doing that might include harnessing the dog, leashing the dog, or tethering the dog. But some disabilities prevent the disabled person from using those kinds of devices, or they might interfere with the service animal's performance of its, 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 its job, such as getting tangled up in a leash, in which cases those, the leash, the tether, the harness may not be required, but the handler has to maintain control of the dog through voice signal or some other effective control. Next page, please. Uh oh, what happened? Uh, can y'all hear me? Yes. You can? Okay, because I just lost the, the, the photograph. Next slide, please. I'm looking at... Uh, go back to the previous slide. Okay. If your dog's not under control, you can expect that um, someone will ask you to remove the dog and that's legitimate. Or if the dog's not housebroken. Um, if there's a legitimate reason to ask that your service animal be removed, they, the staff still must offer you an opportunity 
to, to remain and obtain the goods or services without the animal's presence. Next slide, please. Allergies and fears. Many people wonder, well, what happens? I, if, I, if I go to work, my coworker's allergic to dogs. What are they gonna do? Well, it's a balancing test. And you can think of this, sometimes allergies amount to disabilities. So you've got two people with disabilities. But the general rule that is that allergies or even fear of dogs are not valid reasons to deny access or refuse service to people using service animals. What should be happened, what should happen if possible is that the two folks should be separated if they have to spend time in the same room or facility, like if they're in a classroom or at a homeless shelter, they should be separated and accommodated away from each other to different locations in the facility. Next page, please. Service dogs may be any breed, any size, any weight. There are a lot of um, myths about certain breeds of dogs, but no breed should be excluded because of the stereotypes that surround that dog. If, however, a dog behaves in a way that poses a direct threat to the health or safety of others, has a history of doing that, uh, is not under control of the handle, handler, that animal can be excluded. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a, an illustration. Bully breeds typically have been given an undeserved reputation. Many bully breeds serve as excellent service dogs, no matter their size, um, no matter their size. I was gonna mention that there was a story in the paper in, from a small town on the coast of South Carolina. A, a veteran had lived there for many, many years and had his service dog, which was a German shepherd, um, the German Shepherd got loose and apparently bit two other dogs and perhaps one neighbor. And this went to court. And the judge said, well, sorry, you're going to have to get rid of the German Shepherd. You know, that, that situation, I think, could have been resolved differently. You know, there might have been other alternatives. But again, if your dog's not under control and poses a direct threat, it may be excluded. Next slide, please. Layla's Law in South Carolina. It is a crime to interfere with or obstruct a service animal to allow an unrestrained dog to interfere with the service animal, to take unauthorized control of the service animal, to intentionally or recklessly injure or cause the death of a service animal. And the consequences for that crime include fine, imprisonment, and restitution, that's money, for harm cause. Next slide, please. Again, in, in South Carolina, we have a new code section, which came, it arose because not long ago, folks were realizing that, that some people who did not even have disabilities um, or some people with disabilities were, were claiming that their dog was a service animal and the dog was not a service animal. So the legislature enacted this, this provision of South Carolina law, intentional misrepresentation of an animal as a service animal. The first offense is $250, second offense 500 and the third offense 1000. It's not a good thing to do. And it really talking about being an ambassador for people with service animals, this, this does more harm than anything else, I believe. Next slide, please. Enforcing your rights. If you believe you've been illegally denied service or access, that would be those ADA Title II and III protections, you may file a complaint with the US Department of Justice. If, say for example, you believe you've been discriminated against in work, in your employment because you have not been permitted the reasonable accommodation of having your service dog with you, you, you may have a right to file a private lawsuit in federal court under the ADA. But before doing that, if it is an employment matter, as opposed to a matter of access or service, you must go through an administrative process 
with either the South Carolina Human Affairs Commission or through the EEOC. And I have put a number here, 800-531-0725 for the South Carolina Human Affairs Commission who has information on service animals and it can be very, very helpful. Next slide, please. Resources. Oh good, we're not too late. Our office just came up, our, our former um, legal director, managing attorney, did this um, wonderful piece of work. It, it, it's a booklet, a resource guide on assistance animals. It's quite thorough and you can access it through our website, which is given here. There are other sources of information on service animals that I have found particularly helpful and they are also listed on this resource page. Um, next slide. And there you have information for us and for me, contact information, phones, website. Um, and I believe that's the last slide. So Maggie, do we have any questions? We can open it up for questions at this time. Um, you can put them into the chat box or raise your hand. Um, okay, I, I see. I'm, I'm just reading what's popping up for me. Okay. Someone asked or said that their son's school is not allowing a service dog. That's something that I believe we would be happy to talk with you about if you would like to contact our agency on our helpline and you would be referred to someone with, with answers more specific to your situation. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions or comments? Let's see what, someone's asking what the South Carolina provisions for many horses as service animals. Stacy, I, I will give you the citation to that law. Stacy's an attorney, she's a friend of mine. She's also the, the chair of the South Carolina Bar um, Animal Law Committee. I can give you citations to that law, but it is true that South Carolina, as well as the federal government, has protections for miniature horses. Um, any, any other questions? Maggie, did you see any before? No, we can give it a minute. Okay. Hi, Jeff, I have a question. Yes. Um, so when you were talking about the Supreme Court case, the 2017 case with the student, and then you had mentioned that the school and the family ended up coming to an agreement. So in general, is it does it work that way where schools don't have to allow service animal? It just kind of depends on what they decide with the family, or is it protected under ADA for schools in general? Everything depends on the facts of the particular case. That was a case that made its way up through the various levels of court to the United States Supreme Court. Um, Wonder Dog, <laughs> you know, and um, it, it was it was a seminal case, very important. The issue really that went to the Supreme Court was what law applies. the The question was whether it was um, IDEA, which is a law that protects students right to a fair, a free and, free and appropriate public education, or is it the ADA? Justice Kagan wrote the opinion and she strongly suggested, I have just lost my, my I hope you can hear me. Uh, there you are, I keep losing my picture, um, that it was the ADA that governed. The Supreme Court was not in a position to make a decision, but they sent the case back to the lower courts. And I, I don't know, I can't remember exactly what happened in the lower courts, but I, I do know the arguments that were made by both sides. And I know that eventually, her name was also Elena, the young, the young student, um, was able to become independent enough that she didn't need her service dog in school, but that was later on. But nevertheless, her claims survived. And, and there were claims for damages, you know, emotional distress. I her the main point that the parents had argued was that having her service dog was a bridge to independence. 
and it helped her make friends like other students who were able to make friends who were not students with disabilities and, and, and a lot of other things. It had nothing to do with the education she was getting. It had to do with her right to independence and to access, which are rights that are protected by the ADA and not by the IDEA. I don't know if that answers your question. I, I'd encourage you to read it. It, 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 it is very, it, it's good. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. All right, I don't see any other questions at this time, so we can go ahead and wrap up. Um, this presentation will be available on our YouTube channel in a couple of weeks. Um, and don't forget that we have sessions coming up in October and November on assistive technology and guardianship. We appreciate everyone's time coming out today. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank y'all for the information. <laughs> sure. Bye-bye. <laughs>